Hello friends, and welcome to episode 58 of From the Van. It's a podcast, From My Van, where I have conversations with people who have relationships with residential vehicles. I'm your host, Marty Benson, and today's episode features Johnny and John. I've been talking to Johnny on over Instagram for probably a year plus. Uh, he is from Alabama, and he lives in a low-top Ford Transit van that he has outfitted himself for habitation. He spends most of the year up in New England driving around taking pictures of college kids with their consent for their money. Uh, <laughs> he also owns a piece of property down in southern Alabama where he is building what he is dubbing a compound. I think the idea there is to have sort of a communal space on this acre and a half that he's got. And he's got a shed and a trailer there right now and he has pr proven very useful uh, as a friend to some people in who, who are passing through the South, living in vans. Uh, John is actually one of them. He's been staying at Johnny's compound in his van for about a month, I think they said. Um, and you know, right now with the COVID crisis happening and all the gyms shut down, that's what we, most of us who don't have showers in our vans, that's what most of us rely on uh, to have our showers. And at the moment, Mobility is sort of on lockdown still, the gyms aren't open, and full-time van lifers are sort of needing to post up somewhere. That's what we're doing at Patty's house, and uh, that's what John is doing at Johnny's. And so it's been really cool that Johnny sort of opened his space up to help people. Um, they've been working on vans in their downtime, and uh, he's had a few people who have benefited from, you know, using his space to, as a place that they can park and stay legally. Uh, John also runs an uh, online Facebook dating group that I'm going to go check out. Uh, I'm not single, which is why it wasn't on my radar, so I didn't know that it existed, but I think it's hilarious that there is a Van Singles Facebook group. Uh, so go check that out. Uh, and we had a good conversation at a distance. This is the first episode of From the Van that I've done over Zoom with people that I hadn't actually met yet, and I think it went pretty well. Hopefully you enjoy my conversation with John and Johnny. Johnny, what up? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear me. All right, yeah, I got you too, man. <laughs> What's happening? Nothing, just relaxing for the most part today. Yeah. What? You're in Alabama, right? Correct. Okay. South what Alabama. We're about three miles off the Florida line. All right. Um. So it's muggy as fuck there. <laughs> Not at the moment. It's actually in the 70s and low humidity, strangely. Nice. Okay. Man, we, I, after moving here from the south, I've become such a wimp, dude. Like, it was 85 yesterday, and I was crying like a little baby, dude. It's like, well, I'm glad we have this right here in the trailer. Yeah, for sure. Oh, my buddy, uh, my buddy Alex over at Terra X, let me borrow this yesterday. Uh, we're just, oh, shit. Hold on. Yeah. Anyway, we got a uh, this little the old school zero breeze. The pre right. previous version is just like um I think it's only like fifteen a thousand or fifteen hundred BTUs or something like that. It seemed to work pretty well last night, but it uh it dried me and Colette both out. You know, when you got an AC running in that small of space, we both woke up a little scratchy in our throats and stuff. Um, oh yeah. I Run dehumidifiers in these places because of the south here in the compact. Yeah, I never knew. My mom told me because um, she was a real estate agent that if you leave a uh, uh, if you leave a, a building in the low country without AC for very long, it just turns to a mold pit, man. And I I, uh, I, never, I never realized that, but it makes sense. I can't handle humidity that I use here at the compound as like my TV room. I came back after it being locked up four months and I had to do a full deep clean in there mm. because of it. Just the moisture just stuck up in there. Yeah. Gnarly. Oh. So tell me about the compound. So the compound is still being developed. It's on family land where it's on, it's an acre and a half out of three acres of the family land. The main, main living dwelling 
which is what I'm in right now. It's a Hurricane Katrina era FEMA trailer. Okay. So it's never lived in. They had formaldehyde issues, but we'd left it for four or five years and a horse field just baking in the southern sun. So it got the degas and everything. Okay, cool. And I have it parked in, and then I have a portable shed kind of butted in the front of it, connected with a deck. And that's the spare bedroom or TV room, den room. And then right. I've got a work shed. And then next to it, we just got through finished building an outside shower. Okay. Cool. Is anybody there full time? Because I know you're in the van a good part of the year, right? Well, my mom is on the other half of the property. She's all right. here all year long. John's with me right now because of the quarantine. What's going, man? Hey, man. It's good as it can be, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, right. So he's been my long term refugee for about a month now during the quarantine. We've had two or three others stop in for a couple of days. Just That's needing a place to set up. Yeah. Are those mostly van people? Yep. Okay. And, and do you know them just from the internet? Are these old homies of yours or what? Uh, internet. Uh, two of them, John runs Nomadic Singles and Nomadic Community on Facebook. There's a and, dating site? Huh? Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, I started it about a year ago, and just, of course, with the whole COVID thing going on, it it's just been booming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sexy. We actually do. <laughs> yeah, right? We actually do a uh, live feed just like this every every two weeks. We got one coming up this coming Saturday. Oh, dope. Very cool. We just put the, we just put the link up on the page, and it's about a two-hour window. Yeah. And then... People just come and go, and we just all talk about, you know, nomadic living and whatnot. Cool. Cool. Um, so how many people have you had come through the compound during quarantine? Uh, for this time, we've John, like I said, John's been my long term. Then we had a girl named Beth and a – I can't remember. Chase. Chase. Chase came through last night on his way from Texas to Orlando. Right on. So – and when Beth was here, we helped her do some renovations in her van, swip, uh, flip the chair around. John, we've done some stuff in his van, and then just adding to the compound here. Nice. Um, Very cool. Did you come down here as a result of the lockdown? Me? Yeah, I was in – right before it all started happening, I was in Boston on a Thursday, and the school I was working at, the location I was working at was off campus. So, but they had, the students already told me that school was already shut down to online classes only. And the next day I was supposed to be at another high-end school in downtown Boston. And they had shut down completely, wasn't allowing students to do anything or gather. The following week I was supposed to be in the Boston greater area and that school shut down. So my office actually called me and moved me back over to upstate New York to work in the office. We thought it was only going to be about two weeks. So the end of the first, so about halfway through the first week, the governor shut down all the gyms. So I was, I actually had to go to a manager's house to continue getting a shower, going into an office every day from eight to four, I believe it was. And I'm not used to an eight to four schedule. I'm used to 10 to 10 at night with my breaks, do as I want to. I don't have someone over my shoulder. I just like, you know, and move into an office environment was a little bit of a struggle. Yes. But after they closed the showers, uh, by Friday, Cuomo said he was shutting down all non-essential businesses, which meant my company that I worked for. And my boss called me up around lunch and said, he's shutting us down. And before he closes down the roads, why don't you go ahead and get back to Alabama while you can and you're not stuck up here? Right. So I may actually be laid off until August if schools even start back in August. Yeah, there's a big question mark on all of that. John, where are you from? I'm originally from Illinois, but I came down from Pennsylvania last. So I came down because of the whole COVID thing. Also lost my job. I had a girlfriend at the time and she lost hers. And then we both packed up the van and came down to Johnny's and been here ever ever since yeah so but i've been traveling around in my van 
close to about two years. So I went from Illinois to, well, not in my van, but I've been traveling from Illinois to Colorado. And then I went Colorado to Oregon. And then after Oregon, I was going to go to New Orleans, but then that's when we got a call to go to, go to Pennsylvania. So then I traveled from Colorado to Pennsylvania and then to New Jersey and Florida. So I just kind of go where I'm needed. Um, I just kind of, you know, the wind blows me wherever I need to go. I'm actually leaving. I'm actually leaving here tomorrow, headed back, headed back to Oregon okay. for the summer. I got a summer gig out there, so I do. I do mostly camps, um, either camp resorts or campgrounds. And one of the camp resorts is actually opening up at the end of this month, so they want me out there by the fifteenth, so that way we can get everything cleaned up, get ready for people to come, and then I just do boat and jet ski rentals for the summer. Wow, that's pretty gutsy for them to be that certain that they're going to open. Yeah. Where is that in Oregon? Uh, Bend area. Oh, okay. So it's about, it's about 40, 45 minutes outside of Bend. Uh -huh. it's, up, it's up at a lake called Coltis Lake. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. We, haven't, we, we missed Bend last, last fall because we, had to, uh, we got to get to a podcast in Corvallis, but... What kind of van are you in? Uh, an 03 Chevy high top, 2500. Okay. Yeah. Wait, Chevy high top. I'm not sure I'm familiar with this one. So they cut the top. Before I got it, they cut the top and added a fiberglass high top to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a standard 2500 Express, but then they added the fiberglass high top. So it goes roughly to about 5758 on the inside. All right. So I can stand up just to the top of my head in it, which is perfect for me. And um, but yeah, I've been in that for close to two years. I'm debating on either keeping it or getting rid of it because I do this full time. I'd like to eventually have you know shower and kitchen set up. So I was thinking about either a box truck or um, or a short bus or a shuttle bus. Yeah. It's, that's always a question for us is sort of like, I would love to live in a big ass bus, but the, oppor the yeah. self opportunities are so limited once you start doing that. It's like right. that trade off, right? If you're going to be hanging at Johnny's in a place that you've been invited to come work, then that's a different deal, right? But like, right. Well, yeah. and that's kind of what I do is I've been doing, um, I've been doing seasonal work now for six years. So I started off doing ski resorts and then I start and then I started going into the camp world. So I started doing camp hosting and campground resort work and whatnot. Just, and then, so they give me um, a full hookup spot. It's water and electric and then a shower and a toilet and then $13 an hour plus tips. Hell yeah. So, and then, the, you know, and then they give us a meal a day too. Nice. So, I mean, I can't beat it. You know, they give me a place to park my rig for the summer. Last summer, I didn't move my van probably six times. Wow. So, I just kind of stay around the resort and either carpool in and get – because we're about an hour away from a grocery store where I'm going to be at. Mm -hmm. So, we just all carpool in and do groceries and then go back up. Yeah, nice. Well, get a big-ass van then. Get a bus. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, Johnny, what's the company that you work for? Uh, it's a – well, I'm not going to give the name directly. I just don't want them harassed. Okay. <laughs> it's – um, we work with uh, college student groups, mostly fraternities and sororities, doing their yearly headshots. We're one of five major national companies out there. And the one I work for, I've been with them going on 13 years. And I think some of the other companies, you're actually in teams – our company, you're actually solo by yourself. So moving into a van and they give you a road expense a week on top of a paycheck. So they're basically covering if you, I used to go hotel to hotel to hotel, food and gas. Now I don't have a hotel anymore. So that money just goes back into the van. That's dope. <laughs> Getting the same per diem. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. 
right. so getting it and just you know paying for my wi-fi and then a planet fitness membership is all i all my really big bills of housing to say now in the van on the road right yeah that wow so well let's talk about your van first but i, I want to get into this whole like uh van life and the new normal in a minute um <laughs> Because things are changing, you know, we never considered getting a shower or anything. You're in a low top, uh, full size low top transit, right? Right. I'm in the shortest and sh shortest and shortest, both tall and length, of the Ford Transit full size. So yeah. I can't really stand up in it. I can sort of lean over like you were in the mattress. Right. And I've got so much of the equipment for the job that takes up a mass majority. So I have just carved out enough for me to have a place for my refrigerator or a small desk, microwave, my twin size bed, and just a little bit of a floor space just to have extra room. But then all the extra space I've made a dresser and a drop down attic, everything else that I could into. Yeah, I saw your video tour. You got a you got a really efficient use of space in there. I got one more problem spot that I want to try to conquer, What's but that? until then, it's where my espresso machine goes right next to the uh, refrigerator. That's just a cubby hole of stuff just gets lost up in there. Yeah. So I'd like to have some kind of like pull out drawer that holds the entire area that the espresso machine can come out with it as well. Why'd you choose to go with the, with the short top? Uh, the reason that I went with the van I did, I'm working in a lot of towns. So Philly, Boston, uh, Utica, New York, Syracuse. And a lot of times I have to get in parking garages. I have to be able to parallel park. So I think in some areas of Boston, I'm at the max of a parallel parking spot to where I'm literally, when I park in, the line is at my bumper and my bumper. I have no other room left. You know how tall you are? Me? Oh, the, the, the van. van itself? <laughs> um, I know before I got my KO2s on there, I needed seven and a half foot clearance. Okay. And I think the KO2s raised me two, three inches. So I'm under eight foot. All right. Sure. What do you have on top? Uh, two 100 watt Renogy panels and a Max Air Deluxe fan. Okay. Um, John, do you, have, do you have power on your van? I have solar. Okay. Running goal zero. Right on. So I got the 1250 uh, package, and it's got a 100-watt uh, panel hooked to the top of it. Okay. And then I don't, ha I don't have any fans in mine, so I don't have – the only thing on top of mine is the solar panel. Right. Um, so what – What's up? I'm, like, trying to figure out what Johnny's doing over here. He's trying to shade us in. Oh, yeah, that's pretty bright. Oh, that's way better. Way better? Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, I just – I made a rack, got it welded at a welding shop, and then – because I was going to have to either go buy, like, a painter's rack and, like, a ladder rack and cut it and weld it and do all that anyways. So I just ran over to a welding shop and had them fabricate me up a, a rack for the top, and then I took the – uh, the briefcase style goal zero panel so it folds in half but I unfolded it and I just bolted it right into that to that bracket that I had made right on and it's just you got cables coming in through a gland standard sort of deal there or what I I actually never really cut the hole I have enough room in the corner of the door that it doesn't pinch to the wire yeah. I was actually I was actually gonna do that here but I couldn't find the the cable plug to be able to actually the one that's actually made for it. Um, I know a lot of boat marina places sell it, so I'm gonna wait till I get out west. And you know, all the dealerships and stuff are like closed right now, so you can't get any any parts from those places. So I was gonna I was gonna do it like I said when I was here, but I'm just gonna wait till I get out west and go to this shop and get a, get the right piece. Yeah, sure. Cool. So, um, with the people passing through, uh, how do you feel like everybody that you've like run into or had over or talked to, how's, how's all the van crowd out there coping with all of this stuff? 
Um, for my, it's trying to find somewhere to shower is probably the biggest part. Um, pretty much on the East Coast, we don't have BLM land, so people have found other ways to try to park. So there's none of the BLM land closing down. A lot of our state parks have closed down. I was reading today that Tennessee apparently is op- is starting to open some of their parks. Mm-hmm. But things are slowly starting to open back up. But like me, I'm pretty much in the Northeast eight months a year, and I'm parking lot to parking lot or industrial areas as I'm traveling. So I don't get the joy of going out to a BLM land or anything else up there. It is nice. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I imagine like what what is your prediction in terms of like uh, of getting back to work? Your your gig basically is is reliant on them opening on site schools back up. Is is that right? Yep. And opening schools back up, and then first, Governor Cuomo of New York has opened up businesses, not essential businesses, back up. Yeah. Because even if I could go to schools, that means the fact the production studio that we have in in New York, nobody's there to process the images, print them, or make our final products. Right. Because they can't be in house right now. Uh huh. So we would just be stockpiling a bunch of images that can't be worked on, even if we could work right now. Yeah. And without. You know, it would also then, they'd have to have the internal accountant there to process the paperwork, make sure we're getting paid, or I would be basically essentially furloughed until they can give me my pay because they wouldn't have anybody in-house doing the paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. So I would assume that by the time you're back to work, Planet Fitness is also probably going to be back open. Um, That's what I'm hoping for. If not, I'm going to have to... I had already, when I first started into the vans, I said if I couldn't find a place to get a bath and I couldn't find a cheap campground that I could pay for, I would go and find those nasty, crappy hotels, just sleep in the parking lot and just pay to basically go in and use their shower and run back out. Yeah. You know, that would give me a place to park and, you know, a shower and a toilet that I wouldn't have to worry about. And if it was 30, 40 bucks, that's still better than 70, 80 dollars. Sure. Sure. You know, out the and if you're just running in and out to like shit and shower, you don't have to worry about that infidelity COVID. Right. Oh yeah. You're, you know, at some of the hotels, man, it's, I just, after so long, I just started getting tired of being in the hotels. You'd get into a hotel. It looks nice and clean and the lights are next to the headboard on the bed. And if you just get the right angle, you can tell there's been substance shot on the headboard, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you look down in the mornings, you're like, what is that stain? And you're like, second thought, I don't want to know what that stain is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, or wake up with bites all over you from the bed bugs. Mm-hmm. I just, it's much happier now with having the van. Plus I'm not, ha- when we, I was doing hotels, I would have to take all my, equi- I was required to secure my equipment mm-hmm. at all times. So I was loading all my equipment in at night, loading it back up, going to the first location, unloading, loading when I'm done, go to the second location, do that again, third location, at the end of the night, come back to the hotel and unload again. Right. Right now, I don't have to worry about that. I'm in the van with the equipment. <laughs> You're your own security guard at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your, what's your, are you shooting with a DSLR? What's your setup like? Uh, the company provides a DSLR. I think I'm at a Nikon. It's a 52 or 5700. I'm not for sure. My old camera, I had got it when they first gave them out to the company. And the I had used it so much. I'm taking, let's see, I have 500 sittings a week at four pictures per sitting. So I'm doing thousands of photos a week. Yeah. So after about six years, the camera just gave out on focusing. Mm-hmm. So I just got this one. I'm not happy with it, but I do like the files are sharper than my last camera they get. They provided me. Yeah. Well, that's the good thing with this company is I don't have to have any of the equipment they provide at all. That's awesome. Have you, um, have you considered trying to figure out a shower or there's just not space for that in your van? <laughs> <laughs> there's no space in his van for that. I don't. I can't even do dishes in my van, man. Yeah. I. I. That's why I have a microwave. I can't really cook in my van. 
I have an instant pot. I've used it one time. That was inside a hotel room. Oh yeah. I have a butane stove, a pot, and a frying pan. I've not used either of them since I've been in there. I hold on to it in case I am somewhere and I want to cook a steak. I can cook a steak. You know. Yeah. But it's mostly just leftovers or whatever I can find decent to throw in the microwave. Uh-huh. You know, lucky for me, I am getting that per diem for food, you know, for everything on the road. So it's not like, oh, I need to budget even more. Right. But it does help to put back into the van whenever I do save money. Mm-hmm. How old is it? It's a 17. I got it December 2017. And my suggestion is if you're going to get a van brand new, Go end of the year. Get their end of the year uh, deductions and everything else. I went two years looking at all different vans, test driving them. Then I started getting down to what van I wanted. And then I went to multiple Ford dealerships. And I gave them one number off on my telephone number, one letter off on my email. And I kept getting what their offers were at multiple dealerships around the country. And I came in, went to a local dealership that had exactly what I wanted. I walked in like I was dumb. I didn't know what models they had or anything else after I'd already scouted it. Went to the guy and said, and I had already been pre-approved for my bank. So I go in there and I act kind of dumb with it. And he's telling me this and that. I'm like, oh, so it's got this. Oh, oh, nice. It's got that. But it's everything that I wanted because I'd pre-looked at it. And then I got him down to low the lowest price they could. And I was like, Oh, I think there's also this incentive right now. He goes, Oh, you're right. I forgot that one. So when they got it down to where below the loan that I was approved for, I then took out my keys and I said, Oh, by the way, I want to trade in my truck. And he's like, what do you mean trade it in? You should have told me that to begin with. I said, well, I didn't think about it, but I want to trade it in on this. And I only owed like 15,000 on the truck. And I told he goes, so what's the trade in? I said, he says, well, what's the loan on it? I said, I think it's like 19. So I gave it a higher number and I learned if you tell them, they're not going to look your loan up while you're there at the moment and, or before they give you an idea of what the trade in value is going to be. So if you give them a higher number, they're going to give a trade in value a little higher than they normally would. So between the incentives and the offer they gave me on that, I basically still came in just below the sticker price of my van. And then the finance guy kept wanting me to get the extended warranties and this warranty and that, which I wanted. So I kept hardballing him. I said, man, my bank's not going to let me do it. He goes, what if we finance it? I said, you can't beat my credit union. They've got the best interest. And he sat there and he hauled around for a minute. He goes, if I can beat it, will you take the warranties? I said, how are you going to beat it? He goes, I can put in 0% interest on your loan. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) Because they get their money from their warranties and I'd already beating down on everything else. Dang. So I ended up going with it and getting the warranties versus going with the uh, two something interest I had. I'm still saving money in the long run. That's awesome. So if you can beat them down, man, (laughs) I'm so bad about that sort of thing. I mean, I think I got a really good, I did the same thing, not nearly as meticulous and thought out, but uh, I took the Metris in uh, to get the oil changed at the Benz dealership and the Dodge dealerships right next to it. And uh, this was in January and we decided we wanted a ProMaster. And I'm like, Colette, let's just go and drive one while we're waiting, you know, cause they got our house. We got to stay in the neighborhood anyway. Um, <laughs> I was like, let's just go drive one around. I don't care what size it is. I just want to see how it handles and stuff. And we walked up and it was the, they had the exact 2019 van in early 2020 with like 35 miles on it. And they were just, they had priced it so that like somebody would buy it right away. And so we got basically got it for what I was planning on paying for a a van that had 30,000 miles on it, you know, like one year old or whatever. Um, so I had no idea. I was never planning on getting a new van, but it was the same price as a used one. So we did that. Um, what about, so you said you just had two other people come through. Right. Are they, are they, um, COVID free? Yes. <laughs> they moved, moved somewhere else. Yeah. 
Uh, right. well, Beth, Beth, she was from the Atlanta area, and she okay. was just getting tired of being in the city, and she just wanted to break away from it. And I think she also was having trouble trying to find showers and stuff like that. And I'm only four hours from Atlanta. And we told her that we would help her do some renovations and stuff in there. So while we helped her, she actually became our cook. So we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day from her. And we just basically did side projects with her van. I actually had another mattress that I'd bought, but I couldn't return it. And I didn't like it. It was just too firm. And she needed extra padding. So we ended up taking that mattress and cutting it down some for her van and got her a new bed and raised up the bed, put in some storage, flipped her seat. We did a lot of side projects for her. Where's she going yeah. on to now? Is she back, back over towards Atlanta or something? Right. She's back over there, and she's got a friend of hers that's uh, just a little bit of time outside of Atlanta, I think, that's letting her use a shower there. Right. Take advantage of what you can in your area. I feel like this is sort of we're, what we're doing. I'm just – uh, like you said about the hotel, though Colette's mother's house is not filthy. Um, we, we still just don't stay here. You know what I mean? We sleep in the van and we're using her sh shower and stuff. But one of the things that's so bizarre on top of not having access to our gym showers and stuff is that at least in San Diego County right now at the parks and the beaches, they're sort of starting to open stuff, stuff back up for public recreation but all the parking lots are still closed and park parking lots is like the place that you can go and hang out with the doors open and stuff without being harassed by people. And so we're really fortunate to have Colette's mom's place to do that in, because even in Encinitas where we live normally, um, that's not really an option at the moment because all the beach parking lots are, are closed. What, what is the, what is the vibe where you're at right now? Are, are people wearing masks in the store? Are people being super careful? What's the deal? So the county I'm in, in my hometown that we're closest to, I think we only have three cases, if that. The entire county is less than 20 cases here. You'll see people wearing masks in the stores, but nobody wears them right. They got them below their nose or just on their face, hanging, driving through town in their van and their vehicles with them on. Uh, Walmart's got separate lines for you to go in, and they're counting. And they're like, yeah, we can get like 900 people in here before we're at the safety max. And this town's so small that it's going to be hard to get 900 people in there. Yeah. You know, I, my high school was 70 people when I graduated in my class. Oh, wow. It's under 500 people the entire high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> there's not a lot here. I'm super interested to see uh, what this does to – like van dwelling and also um also the bro broader culture right in terms of my my dad and one of my good buddies my dad lives at uh inland, inland from myrtle beach south carolina where i grew up and uh and my buddy aaron he lives in la and both of them said aaron was like i want to get the fuck out of the city because you know if this if this is manages to resurface for some reason, if a vaccine doesn't work or something like that, uh, density living is going to be a lot less attractive to a bunch of people. Have, have either of you sort of, has this shifted the way that you think about like what you're doing with your, your residential vehicle situation and like traveling and stuff? Do you anticipate you're going to act different? Are you thinking about getting out of the van? I'm not thinking about getting out of it. Actually, when this all started, like my mother was kind of nervous at first and she goes, hang on a second. You carry enough water. You've got enough food for a month and non-perishables. You've got your refrigerator. You're fine. You know, so it was actually being in the van was actually, I think easier. I mean, it's, I enjoy being in the van more than I do back here on the property. But if I was in the van, I'd be bored and no access to a shower because you really can't go and do much. Right. You know, and when I'm home here on the property, I do open it up for people coming through. But like you said a while ago, I'm mostly home in the deep of summer. Nobody wants to be in South Alabama that time of year. So, like, this is the most people I've had come through probably in a year. Yeah. Because I've 
in here just during COVID, just needing that layover spot or somewhere to escape the city for a little while or someone a l more long term to stay. Yeah. What about you, John? Um, well, I've kind of noticed is that I've been planning more ahead on things like trying to figure out like what states have what closed down and because like let's use Texas for example they have actual checkpoints where they're pulling people over and doing um they're checking temperatures and whatnot of you just driving down the road no way so, so, yeah so I'm like you know I have to think about I'm going from Alabama to Oregon I'm like what route am I going to take what states do I need to stay out of what you know all that kind of stuff and even in like some parts of uh, Colorado, for instance, they were certain counties are pulling people over and giving them five hundred dollar tickets if they have out of plate or out of state plates. Wow! Just because they're out traveling, if they don't have a reason to be an essential traveler right now, like I had to get a, a letter emailed over from the person that I'm hired on with, yeah, and basically giving me an okay travel pass, basically to be able to go across the go across the United States to be able to, to drive. Yeah. Because I have I have everything of mine registered in Florida. So my plates are in Florida, kind of where everything, you know, started at with this whole thing. And so if they saw me coming from Florida across state lines and you know, I I have a feeling that I would get pulled over and I might even get pulled over while I'm traveling. And so it is kind of nerve wracking thinking about that. Um, the last time I did a big drive through like this, I didn't really think about any of it. I just put it in the GPS and drove. So it's kind of like, you know, just planning ahead and going online and using more of your resources and more people like everybody else that's traveling around, figuring out what the road roads are like and whatnot before I actually get out there and do it. But since all this has been going on, this is my first time actually being probably back out on the road like you know doing a big travel like this yeah I, i've been a stationary i usually do like six months at a time stationary in one spot so i don't do like i don't move every week or every two weeks or you know like some people do in the van line yeah um this this whole thing i've been being in the being in the surfing world territorialism is a big thing that I've sort of like raged nuts man not being able to hit the ocean well you know man it's like I got a bunch of friends who are being really cranky about it and stuff but you know this is an unprecedented deal you know what I mean and like I'm not trying to get I probably would be okay if I caught it you know but I'm not trying to get somebody else sick so if I have to not surf for a couple months the beaches are actually open as of today in San Diego County, a bunch of them. So I could be surfing right now, but I'm gonna wait a couple of weeks to see if there's if there's an uptick in shaggy blonde headed dudes getting coronavirus. <laughs> getting knocked off. Even yeah. locally here, our creeks are uh they're taped off with signs with threats of fines if you go to the creeks here. Yeah. You know, it's not gotten hot hot here yet, but we've had a couple of heat waves hit the nineties so far. And people weren't social distancing enough and having a crowd. And the cops came down giving everybody warnings, kicked them off the banks in town, and roped it all off. Yeah. So yeah. you're in San Diego? Yeah, yeah. Northern San Diego County. Not the city of San Diego, but. Okay. Well, you'll probably know this then anyways. I'm really kind of curious how the uh, vehicle living law changed recently out there. I think it was like in the last – six months or a year they legalized uh vehicle living situation so yes and no what happened was um pretty much every munis coastal municipality in southern california has some form of vehicular habitation prohibition either it's not legal to sleep in your vehicle from such and such a time or you can't sleep in public or you can't park an RV or van that's been outfitted for habitation overnight. Um, each It goes town to town. Each municipality is different. Um, a couple of years ago, a group of um, 
disabled homeless people who are being targeted. You know, there are people who, like us, who have the resources to live in a building but choose not to. And then there are people who are not electively living in a vehicle. It's just their best option, you know. And right. as will happen, uh, what was happening was there was this blanket prohibition on vehicular habitation in San Diego. And the cops were sort of focusing disproportionately on these homeless people who had no better option. And so a law firm got some of them together and they filed a suit uh, against the city to try to uh, invalidate this, this ordinance as, um, as unconstitutional. And a federal district court judge um, agreed with them and said that it was too broad and vague uh, to, be con to be enforceable. And so for a while after that decision came down, a lot of the municipalities in Southern California either uh, retracted or um, they either repealed or just quit enforcing they, their vehicular habitation prohibitions. In the city of San Diego, they repealed it. They totally did away with it. Uh, the city council did. And what they did was they went back to the drawing board to narrow the focus of the thing, adding some new language in so that they could have something that would pass constitutional muster. And they did that. They passed that in like May of, I think mid-May of last year. So as yeah. of then, it became illegal to sleep in a van again, anywhere in the city of San Diego. Oh. And what started happening is a bunch of the other cities followed suit, even if they hadn't repealed their, their ordinances, they started enforcing them again. Um, so it's been a really tumultuous time in the city of San Diego, but a lot of the people that I know who live down in the city of San Diego in vans still haven't had much trouble. They have a place, you know, they found their places where they can park and stuff and they're not really messed with. But I do know people who have gotten tickets and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know certain areas are pretty bad. Like when I was out in New Jersey, they gave me – a 200 or 300 dollar ticket for and i was parked in front of my girlfriend and parents house and they gave me a 200 dollar ticket for parking on the street and they so i have van life on my van so mm -hmm. it's not like you know 100 percent stealthy yeah well they don't know that i was sleeping in there but i'm sure that they were assuming that i was sleeping in there so the cop didn't even knock on my door he just wrote me a ticket and left yeah. And, uh, so the specific ordinance in Encinitas, the town where I live, uh, is that it's illegal to park um, an RV or a van that's been outfitted for habitation between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. on any public street. Okay. And I think what they're banking on, honestly, is that people aren't going to uh, challenge the tickets that they get. So they don't knock on anybody's door. That It doesn't according to the rule, it doesn't matter whether you're sleeping in your van or not. But again, there are tons of nice, like expensive ass sprinters sitting out in front of the owner's $2 million house in Encinitas. And those guys are getting ticketed, you know, no. um, it's the, it's the dirt bags like us <laughs> that are getting the tickets, you know, right. it's, there's a town near me called Fairhope. And last year, I think they passed, any, if you're caught anywhere sleeping on public property, it can be up to a thousand dollar fine. And then if you're inside city limits, they can sleep on your property in your driveway up to 14 nights. After that, the person in the vehicle and the landowner can get ticketed. And if it's a temporary housing, it can only be for a minor. Wow. In the back. Yeah. So. It's I feel like there's a there's a <laughs> there's a hole in our supply and demand in our economic system that's perfect for van life, and it's weird to me that uh, that so many people are so against it. You know, because all of the things that that you could conflate or associate with van life that are actually bad things, like shitting in the street or you know, uh, you know, making a bunch of noise, um, breaking into somebody's house, all of that stuff is already illegal. And so right. it's weird to me that they feel like they have to regulate this thing that doesn't necessarily have a causal connection to any of that stuff. I mean, there's already laws on the books for littering, for dumping, 
for not moving your vehicle after so many, why aren't they enforcing those versus let's make new laws on top of laws on top of laws so that, well, I didn't dump my sewage there. It was just there already and they can't catch them in the act. So they try to fight that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, people are already breaking laws that are in place. They're just not enforcing them right. or they have to be spotted at the time to be ticketed. Yeah. One thing I like when, when I was in Oregon last year, they have, but the, they don't have a law on living in your vehicle, but they're putting it under the banded abandoned vehicle laws. So if you have an abandoned vehicle, you can only, you can leave it on the street for five days. So you can stay in your vehicle basically for five days and then you have to move to a different spot. So they're not, they're not really making like a new law per se, but they're finding their loopholes also to be able to, you know, allow people to stay on the street, but also have a limit on it. It's almost kind of like the BLM law, you know, the full 14 days and then, and then move again, which I personally think would be amazing if a lot more places would allow that. Yeah. I mean, that that's my attitude. We, locally here, most of the cities have a, um, a three day rule. 72 hours is the longest that a vehicle can stay on a public street park anyway, no matter yeah. what kind of vehicle it is. And I think, I think that totally makes sense because you don't want to use your public streets for like permanent storage of somebody's unused crap. You know what I mean? Like you should. Oh, yeah, my aunt, she had her RV in front of her house in her neighborhood, and she owns the lot that she lives on, and she owns the two lots across the street. So it was parked in front of her lots, and they hit her with after about six months of her RV being on the road, they hit her with a warning to move it off the road. It couldn't stay there. Yeah. So she had to move it onto the property itself. That was a short commute. Yeah, <laughs> and it's been sitting there for. 20 years now <laughs> it looks like something out of slab city right now right it's old falling in and everything else have johnny have you been toying with the idea like especially if you're not going to be if you're not going to have any work for the next few months um i mean i know john's got plans to be at this gig pretty soon but have you toyed with the idea of traveling during this time at all uh, I want to, but at the same time, so I shared this property with my mom. She's 67 years old, and with the southern heat, it's hard for her to maintain the yard, so I, I have to sort of be here to mow the yards when they need to be done yeah. to help her out on that. Um, right now, it's going about a month. We've mowed it twice since I've been here so far, and it's been about a month, but... I'd like to try to get out and travel and do something and go somewhere, but I don't think I will until the gyms open back up for one. That's really the only, the maintenance around the yard here and then gyms for showers is the only thing really holding me back. Yeah. I don't think I do too much that puts myself in worry of catching the virus. You know, when I go into a, a store or whatever, I stay away and, but I would like to interact and meet others on the road as well. You know, and people are at different levels of, I don't want to be near you for 14 days if you've been here or this and that. Yeah, it's really you know? difficult for me to figure out. We went um, we went over to our friends, Jenny and Alex. They run, uh, they run a shop, and we went over and had, like, drinks with them last night. But I stayed in my van. You know, I sat on the tailgate. They were in camping chairs, and, like, we didn't touch each other or hug or any of that, you know. It's super weird yeah. to, like, try to figure out what's okay to do and what's not. I really don't know the answer. We are getting a little stir crazy. We're ready to travel, but it's like, it's like John was saying, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to Arizona and having somebody pull a gun on me. Cause I'm came from populated Southern California. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to, I'm probably going to stay in the state for a while. The other thing is too, is like a lot of these places that we all like to travel to are closed. So it's like, you know, they're they're taking that away for us to even think about traveling because if state parks are closed, you know, all the touristy spots that people want to go to are closed. Some of the BLM land is closed, like trailheads are closed. So it's like, where do you travel to? Just drive yeah, around I, in circles? Right. Yeah. I mean, we were actually going to go 
this past Wednesday for six days or something over to some national forest because a lot of the national forests around here, in addition to the BLM land, uh, on the national forest, there's a lot of dispersed camping and yellow, yellow stake spots where you can go and just sort of hang in the van. And we just wanted to do that to get out and hike a little bit and stuff. But there, all of the ranger districts are closed around here. And they told me that the San Diego Sheriff's Department is like chasing people off and threatening to give them tickets and stuff. And the problem would be, we have a ton of BLM land around here and most of it is still open to my knowledge. But the trick with BLM land is, uh, BLM land almost never has streams or trees on it out here. You know, it's all desert. And the reason we were leaving was go to, to go to higher ground to like get out of the heat. But BLM land's hot as hell, except in the winter. Is Joshua Tree open? Is that area open? No, I don't think that the that the park is open. But the BLM land, there's a bunch of BLM land around Joshua Tree, and that's still open. But and it cools down at night, but it's hot as hell right there. There right now during the day. Yeah, and that's the other thing too is it's you know get to, get into that hot stage. So it's like yeah. where do you go? I want to go to Canada, but we can't even go up there. Nope. Yeah, the guy Chase that came through yesterday, he said when he came into Florida. They stopped him on the interstate, and they were the only question was, "Are you from New York State?" And they were letting everybody come through that wasn't from New York State. <laughs> and like when I left work to come back home, my aunt was like, "My aunt, one of my managers, you need to call the health department. You've been in New York." I'm like, "New York City and upstate New York are two completely different places." Upstate New York is way different from New York City than Hoboken is. You know? What oh I mean? yeah. Oh. I, I work in Hoboken every now and then. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> all of those, all of those super close uh, Jersey and Connecticut cities are basically New York city, you know? Oh yeah. I work Trenton. I work Hoboken and Princeton area. And I'm everywhere. There's a major college with Greek life. I've been there in the Northeast almost. Why? I just used to work New York city though. Why are you, why are you primarily in the in the Northeast? <laughs> I used to work Florida to California, uh -huh. and there's a lot more miles to do. And I did it for over six years. There pretty much is not a state park, well, a national park, a cave, an aquarium, a zoo. I have not hit from Florida to California in six years. Wow! And I just got tired of it, and just they I. I don't like the heat, even though I live in South Alabama during the summertime, but I hate working in it. Yeah. So whenever, and I can deal with the cold a lot more. I've gone down the negative eight outside sleeping in my van with my heater going. And I can deal with the cold a lot more than I can the heat. And my personality, I actually get along better with northerners than I do down south at the schools. My boss jokes around and says I'm a northerner born in the south. Yeah. So I have to – I get a dry humor sometimes when people don't get it or they're like, are you being real? You offended me or something. And I just I, – I don't tolerate that. And there's also less mileage in the Northeast. Yeah. And when I used to work out West, I was putting thirty five to 45,000 miles a year on a vehicle. Now it's maybe 25,000. Awesome. Yeah, that's way better. So, John, I, I, I sort of figure out what you were driving. What were you driving before you got the, the van, Johnny? Me? Yeah, uh, yeah. I had an F-150. Okay. It was a Super Crew four-door with a ton of cover on it. And I had it for, a hun hang on, 158,000 miles I had it for this job. <laughs> wow. And the vehicle before that, I had it for 213,000 miles. Jeez. So I decided when I got the van that I wouldn't be trading anymore. I would just be replacing the engine or replacing the transmission since I built it out. Yeah, yeah. We're really hoping to stay in this van as long as possible too. Um, John, why did you why did you get into the van? What what sort of made you decide so, to do that? So before I got into van life, I lost my license for uh, DUI. Okay. And so they took it for five years uh -huh. and after that i so when i lost my license i started traveling by 
planes, trains, automobile, basically. And um, I got into Colorado and I was just moving around so much and I got into the outdoors and the BLM land and started meeting people that were doing it. And I was like, you know, as soon as I get my driver's license back, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So literally like I got my driver's license back six weeks later, I bought the van. And then six months later I was out on the road and I was moving around from apartment to apartment. And um, as we all know how much it is to buy into an apartment, and then also when you want to leave early, you have to pay so much to get out of an apartment. And then when I was in Colorado, I don't have you been up in Vale Avon, Beaver Creek area? Just passing through. Okay, so that's where I was at. And rent up there, I was paying $2,300 a month for a, for a two-bedroom apartment. Wow. And so we would live – I had I had six people living in a two-bedroom apartment to be able to pay for rent. Yeah. So I was just sick of living with people. I got my license back, wanted to get it back out on the road again. And so that's why I did it, you know, to get out of apartments and be able to just keep, keep moving. How long ago was that that you moved into the van? Two years. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So Uh, I love, I want to keep doing it. I'll, I'll keep doing it till I don't even know when. Just like our life is, you know, no plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean, I really wish that we, like, that's that's totally our deal, too. With Like, we went all the way from here in Southern California to Montreal and New York last fall. We just missed Johnny by, like, a couple of weeks, I think. Um, but like you said, John, like, we we didn't – we didn't really have a plan. You know, we, we sort of drew some lines on the map of where places that we needed to go to and stuff, but we we never stick to that. (laughs) What's that? We never stick to that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the thing is you get to a place that you want to be and you're like, Oh, let's, let's waste some days here and we can save on them, you know, some by not staying somewhere else for a little while. But right now it's like, you do have to be a lot more deliberate. I think about, you know, where you're going to go and, how you're going to make sure that you can get there and stuff. I didn't realize that there were so many controls out on the road. Yeah. So a lot of the rest areas are closed. So it's just truck stops now. Oh, wow. And one option, if you are traveling right now, truck stops, you can still go in and get a shower at them, but that's 10 to $18, depending on where you're going. If you're not buying, if you're buying diesel, you can get a percentage on that for a free, for a shower or something at some of them. But I don't think they do it for gasoline. Yeah, the the when I've showered at I was on a cross country trip and I showered at a pilot station and I was alone. Colette wasn't with me then. And I was blown away by how clean the shower was. Like I would not hesitate right now to go shower at a pilot station for fear of coronavirus or whatever, because they clean the whole bathroom between every shower. And yep. then this couple, this older couple, middle-aged, probably 60-year-old couple, um, comes in after me. They're waiting in line, and they go in and shower together. I was like, oh, that shower was only $6 a piece, you know? <laughs> and I wish Colette was with me, but, yeah, they are. They're crazy expensive. I guess that's the – They do, like, a punch card at some of the some of the truck stops. Oh, yeah. Where, like, if you do, you know, five showers, get one free kind of thing. Uh huh. That's what a lot of the truckers do. Also, is get those. How long? How long are you expecting that the trip's going to take you to get to your spot out in your bend? Um. Well, I have to be there by the fifteenth. Okay. So, I just kind of going with it. I have a place in Oklahoma that. So I'm going to stop there for a day or two. I have a buddy that has another compound out there uh, called Painted Acres. Yeah, and he he's been working on that for like three years now. So I'm gonna stop in and check check that out, and then I have a friend in Arizona that I'm gonna stop there, and then those are my only two really planned out stops, and then after that I'm gonna get up to to Bend. So I don't know, eight days, nine days. Yeah. So I I mean it's a forty hour ride, and I 
at the very most, I like to do like seven hours, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. So, but with also stopping and seeing other people. And that was the thing too, is like, this is the first time that I've ever really planned out a few stops along the way, like people's houses or anything to stay at. So like being on these groups and meeting other people out there that are doing this, you know, to be able to stop at their houses and be able to use stuff has been like amazing that so many people are open to it. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, it's cool to hear. I don't really know anybody um, who's got a compound, but I know that a bunch of people have been talking about it, you know? And it's I think it's going to be the new, the new thing. It's going to be like, it's not new, you know, it's out there, but I think after this, a lot more people are going to be living communal lifestyles yeah you know getting together and buying a piece of property and having say 10 rigs on it i mean after this year i have i have roughly like six friends that have different pieces of property across the united states yeah and i actually just got the question asked to me the other day they're like someone was like well why don't you buy a piece of property and and do that same thing and i'm like I know so many people with property now that I don't need to buy a piece of property. I just go stay at other people's <laughs> places, right. you know, for a couple of months at a time. And then when my seasonal jobs come in, then I go and park at like camp for six months. Right. Yeah. So I think this year what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to courtside though for winter. Okay. And do that for the winter. I have a buddy that his dad and him live full time out on the road not together, but they have a piece of property also in Arizona that they know a bunch of people out there to be able to get side work. Like I do construction and painting and all that kind of work usually during the winter time to mm -hmm. kind of get by. And so when I have off time, that's what I do is I'll just go Craigslist hunting for side jobs and make it, make it that way. Yeah. Right on. Dan's um, making a shadow in the back. What's that? Oh, Dan's That's making Dan. a shadow. In the back. Yeah, <laughs> he's being quiet this time. Um, he he chills out. Uh, when it gets when it gets super hot out, it's probably seventy five degrees, and once it hits about seventy, it calms him down. And we've got a long rope that he just sort of we got his little dog bed outside of the van, uh, but he just had to come up because Colette's mom pulled her car out so that she can go to the gym, which is just a spot that's set up in her garage where she normally parks her car. Cause that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you guys for coming on the podcast. Good luck with your trip. I'm interested to hear how it turns out. John. Um, do you guys want to, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to grab me on Facebook and on Instagram after this, um, I'm going to be doing a bunch of posts and whatnot about, you know the road and how the how the travels are out there and stuff like that so cool that's what i was just about to say if you guys plug your instagram accounts or anything else you want to before we go okay uh i do van life days van underscore life underscore days and then my name's john dean and i also run uh nomadic community and then nomadic singles cool and my Instagram is Adventures of Hermes, spelled A D V Hermes underscore the underscore van. And that's where I put everything from my travels in the van, my experiences, and also the development and living here at the tiny compound. Right on. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the progress at the at the compound too. Well, hopefully in about a year or two I'll have it completely done up and everything the way I want it. Right on. So, is yeah. right now it's we have the time. I just don't have the funds for it anymore. We just finished a wall on the front of it yesterday, and I, my building budget is shot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm I'm unemployed now too, dude. I'm super curious to see whatever what what happens. Um, and I'm, maybe we'll come through uh, Alabama, but we're not doing it unless it's between. November and early March. <laughs> I'm home early December to early January. All right. So we'll if we go see the folks. now, if you come in during that time, early December, I host a camping event now uh, near 
uh, Perdido Key in Florida outside of Pensacola yeah. called a tiny Christmas camp out. And it's from vans to tents to teardrops and homemade campers. We decorate them all up for Christmas, do a potluck, do a competition, and hang out at bonfires every night. Awesome. That sounds fun. Hey, so. speaking of van meetups, are you going to descend this year? When is it? September. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be um, – working remotely right uh, for for i've been working on environmental campaigns for the last few years i'm not sure if i'm going to be working on a campaign down here or remotely or if i'm going to be unemployed or have to get a job at a at a grocery store you know what i mean it just depends on depends on how, how everything shakes out so i hope to but i don't know yeah i think that's the only one that's actually still still going on so far yeah i've heard it's great it is. I went last year. It, yeah. it, they had 1,200, 1,200 rigs out there. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 All right, guys. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, Peace out, man. Have a good one. Be safe. All right, guys. We did it. It was cool to talk to those guys. It's sort of uh, it's it's interesting during this time for me to sort of get a snapshot of what is going on during the pandemic lockdown uh, with van lifers who are in different parts of the country and stuff. So it's super interested, interesting to hear about the fact that John has to make this trip soon and he's sort of trying to calculate how he's gonna do it without being bothered by people um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so it was good to catch up with those guys, follow them on Instagram and come back next week for another episode uh, from the van.